Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Comedy on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone and stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. And we can't thank you enough for making this part of your day today. And before I hit the road... On my way to Santa Fe, Vegas, and New Orleans, I get a chance today to connect to an absolutely cosmic cat. He's, I, I think he's laid below the radar for, uh, for his own reasons, but he came up at a time in music when there was a lot of authenticity. Obviously, cats were trying to make FM hits or radio-friendly hits, but the bottom line is this cat that I'm about to introduce, tremendous harmonic range, tremendous vocal range. Uh, fantastic guitar player and obviously was you know really one of the country psychedelic dudes on the west coast and I connected with this guy a few years ago because of an album that we just played called Natural Progressions he uh, he wrote a bunch of tunes on it and uh, the recording of it as well made it so warm and these guys looked like they were having such a ball I said where is this cat and well I found him Michael Georgiatis, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hiya, Jake. Thank you. You're welcome, man. Um, you know, I just was hoping you could talk to the to the audience a little bit about, I talked to the late, great John Abercrombie, the guitar player, and obviously he's an improviser and he plays melodic music, but, you know, when he first got hired uh, by an organ uh, player, uh, Johnny Hammond Smith, uh, you know, he had to have great rhythm. Uh, and if you didn't have good rhythm, you weren't going to get a gig. And I'd like you to talk about how you developed rhythm on the bandstand. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. I f actually, when I first started playing guitar, uh, probably, uh, I want to say 19, and there was a guy, uh, there was a, a music store up in Sierra Madre called Frank Green's, I think it was called House of Music or something like that anyway. And it was really great. And a lot of people that came out, like, uh, came out of, the whole early scene out of certainly passing in lived up in in uh Sierra Madre in the canyon up there Lindley was up there absolutely was up there. absolutely anyway this guy Frank Green was he he was just a really very great guy and he loved music and he had a pretty cool little music store anyway I was drawn to flamenco I really just it just blew my mind and there was a guy that taught up there his name was rick or richard rios i have no idea where he is if he is whatever <laughs> happened but this guy was great and you know my dad played guitar a little bit not flamenco but he had a guitar he had a washburn which i he gave away and this is before i started playing but anyway uh he loved classical he loved segovia he loved all that kind of stuff and i expressed this just this really desire to learn flamenco and i took lessons with this guy for a while and sort of developed uh my right hand a bit and i guess that kind of carried over as well and i've always been kind of well you said it there uh, on the intro um kind of behind the scenes that's kind of where I've been comfortable. I mean, I did stuff. I did stuff in the '60s, you know. Well, we're gonna, know. we are gonna vet this. Listen, you are no longer under the radar on the Jake Feinberg show. That you're, it's over now. So I'm, I'm amazed if you actually know anything about what. I, well, no, but I, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, listen. I mean, it, my whole show started with the unsung heroes of black music. So I mean, I've been going, and then it's led itself to all music and you know so anyway the, the, the flamenco this is fascinating I, I it was a it was totally unheard of before i mean you had never heard anything like this before it was on the radio maybe i mean i know robbie krieger was loving flamenco i mean how, oh yeah yeah that's another story okay. yeah 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 um the thing about flamenco as you well know is the whole thing is rhythm rhythmic percussive one guitar sounds like every guitar i mean like five guitars right. and drums <laughs> and i went hey wait a minute if i if i can do this a little bit you know i don't know who's going to be around if they're going to be around i'm not going to have to rely on other people so much so i kind of just was poking around with that and that was a time when 
uh, you know, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Chad Mitchell Trio, Kingston Trio. There was a guy named Tim Morgan that we used to uh, go down to Balboa and see. And he was a real rhythmic player, and he played this uh, sort of classical guitar, and he was a singer. And I was just drawn to these single guys that could be, that could carry it, I guess. So that's pretty much it. I, I just, uh, I really liked creating rhythm. No, and I, and I want, so, 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 because I've, uh, with the medium of with new media now using Facebook Live, I've been obviously going after like younger female artists. Some of them have been busking. Did you busk on the streets for a while? Yeah, busk. I probably did a little of everything. But <laughs> no, I'm talking about to like get your feel to get your to get comfortable in front of playing in front of people as a one man band. Yeah, there was there was some of that for sure, and then there was the occasional little folk group. This is before. Well, Dylan uh, was ju- in '63. I went to the Hollywood Bowl to see Joan Baez. Uh, just I had no idea, you know, that she was going to bring him out, and she trotted him out, <laughs> and and it was the most amazing thing. I was so lucky to be there, and I think that kind of ha- that's the hallmark of my entire life. It's it's. I've just been a really lucky guy to be at the right place at the right time, and I've been around incredible people and, and influenced by them. And I just say that's luck. That's just really luck on my part. There are so many people that, that are just ridiculously great and good, and I don't know, man. I'm just a lucky guy. Yeah, but I mean, a band doesn't get off on five amazing chop players. You need to have a team. What was it about, Mm -hmm. what was it, so talk, and again, luck is a, um, is a, is the residue of, of, uh, of design or something like that. You know, it's like the, the, the bottom line is that, you know, you put, you, 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 you shed it enough and you knew what you wanted to do, uh, in order to put yourself in situations when you got, so you got lucky. So I don't, I'm not just going to say it's. Well, you know, let me use the word fortunate because I, I agree with you on that. Luck is kind of a yeah. It doesn't mean anything. I don't. No. I don't know what it means. It's, no. What is it? Something you take to Vegas or Reno or something. <laughs> but, um, Maybe you write a song yeah. about luck. I mean, what it's 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 it's, uh, it's below. It doesn't it it doesn't uh, encapsulate what we are about to unpack on this program because uh, you know because you can't just account. There are no. Co- I've learned there are no coincidences either. I don't believe in that. I just I I truly believe that. When you lay your heart out there and you put it out there, um, you will find. I mean, you've 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 been around, but I. What was it about Dylan at that time? He had not plugged in. Him and Lomax had not gone to blows yet. It was acoustic. What was it that blew you away? Uh, the the lyrics, the words, and when he came out uh, that night, I'll never forget this. People were just like, oh, man, this guy's awful. <laughs> I mean, he can't sing. And I'm sitting there just going, are you kidding me? Wow. I just got it. Wow. I, you know, I, I don't know. I was in the frame of mind. And I went, oh, yeah, there it is. And that's that's it. And I, that, I was a lifelong, you know, follower, fan, whatever. You, you, um, you know, you cut out there right at the beginning. You said you started playing in 1960. When? What was? I'm the- gonna 61, just to be yeah, perfect, right in there. But you- I started playing trumpet. I played piano. You know, just like everybody in the world took piano lessons when I was six. Wanted to play baseball instead, and the piano lasted maybe I don't know a month, and that was the end of that. And then I played trumpet in the fourth grade, and didn't really, you know, it was a great instrument, but I mean it. That wasn't my instrument. You weren't you weren't like channeling Chet Baker or Miles Davis at that point. You were just sort of you know in your Baker, own. <laughs> you, that that dude, man, talk about people that had to go through stuff. Oh man, both of them. Well, yeah, of course, but I mean, it, I don't know. Just Chet was just he seemed like to be the sweetest guy in the world. Just this really beautiful person, and played very differently than than you know the average person were know. but let me ask, had, you know you're 100 yeah. were you were you did you 
You said your dad was a musician. Was he? Was were you, were, the, were the sounds of West Coast jazz in Georgiotis's ears as a child? No, no, no. I, I, it, my dad was a. Uh, he loved the opera. Okay. My dad was born in born in Greece, and he came over here at twenty four years old. He's an amazing guy, and he loved classical. He loved opera. Uh, we didn't have a lot of jazz going on. We didn't. Um, yeah, that, that's just the way it was over there. So let me ask you this. So I, I had an opportunity uh, a few months back to go visit the uh, the sublime bass player Jim Fielder, who was uh, in Blood, Sweat, and Tears. But he started in Anaheim, uh, mm-hmm. in, in the folk, the Anaheim folk scene, uh, with um, Tim Buckley and uh, this cat Larry Beckett who was writing uh, poetry and they were all inspired by Dylan and when Dylan plugged in this is going into the mid 60s now but this is when Georgiata started to to cook the groove and you know they said Buckley's like well I mean Dylan plugged in why can't we have an electric band so that, so there were, there were all these little regional enclaves of folk can you can you talk about a folk group that you had or that you were part of uh, in that in that burgeoning scene of the 64 or 65 area uh, sh- uh, probably. I can't remember the name of it, but I went to Pasadena High School, and you know, early on, from say '62, '63, uh, there was a guy named Tom Padrick, uh, another friend of mine to this day, Robert Willis. We came up at the same time. Uh, we had a little folk group. I, for the life of me, I couldn't tell you the name of it, but um, we we did that and we played around mostly. You know, Pasadena High School. I went there from '62, three and four, and yeah, we were we were guitar players, and you know, we played around. Nothing memorable, really. That no, but, and, and I'm, you know, you know what I'm more interested in for for my daughters and future generations is, can you talk about the PA systems that you were playing out <laughs> of? Because here's the thing, we <laughs> it, it, yeah. to me when I listen to uh, the tunes. The, the records that you're on and frankly your generation the understand your understanding of dynamics is uncanny not just you i'm just talking about your generation and i i really believe i, mean, I had an interview i had a chance to interview steve cropper uh a couple weeks ago and, and it was you know al jackson was like you know all you need to do is make sure the first c- couple rows uh, are having a good time because nobody else can hear anything i mean the point mm-hmm. is did, did you learn dynamics because of the the lack of really sophisticated sound Yeah, the system. limitations. Yeah, the limitations, yeah. You had one microphone generally if you had, you know, and then you just have to learn how to crowd three people around that, uh, pull back who was singing louder, who was singing softer. And I don't know, that, that was a, that's a really interesting thing you bring up because today, for example, and I'm sure you know, there's every single thing is available from Pro Tools on, on down. Everything is there. Uh, and you brought up another thing right in the beginning of this thing, which I, I wanted to go back to. Yeah, go back. Quickly. Go back. Uh, and that is that putting in the time, putting in thousands of hours, as opposed to, hey, I just want to be famous. I just want to be rich, <laughs> and you know, and everything that goes along with that. Uh, so I'll be in a, a group, not for the love of it. And so, you know, I mean, there was definitely that great weight. You know, it was a great way to meet chicks. Everybody will tell you that. <laughs> and, you know, uh, yeah. so, but the truth of the matter is, I was a pretty serious guy there for a while. I, I just, uh, again, I was fortunate to come up where I came up. Pasadena was, was a great place to, to grow up. And, you know, there was, the ice house was there. Um, I just pulled out the other day out of storage. I just pulled out this... Uh, guitar and this amp that I got in 65 and it was I bought a brand new deluxe reverb and it came with a used guitar there was no such thing as vintage <laughs> and they're sitting in the living room right now the, the the used guitar is a 58 Strat and I bought the uh, deluxe reverb brand new in 65 which I still have and I, you know, I got them from Barry, and there was a music store called Barry and Grassman. Oh, yeah, but let me tell you something, my man. The first, the, the, this is the greatest story of all time, and I don't know, maybe you know this already. When that store opened, uh, the three teachers on the second floor, uh, a cat named Gary Foster was teaching clarinet. 
David Lindley was teaching banjo. And wow. Jim Keltner was teaching snare drum. And I'm going to send you a couple oh. of these interviews because Lindley, at one point, just to piss Keltner off, went over and spilled a Coke on his drum set, and he got really pissed off. But they were selling merchandise downstairs, burying growth. This is legendary. You were so ex you went there and, and bought a guitar, or how did you how did you wind up there? Uh, I w this was the first electric electric guitar I oh. ever had. Unbelievable. And uh, I think I'm pretty sure my dad must have helped me out. Um, and you know the Beatles were happening, and everybody wanted to do that. So there was my little amp and the guitar, and I think the whole set cost probably I want to say about four hundred bucks for a '58 Strat used guitar, no such thing as vintage. And uh, if by some miracle, I still have both of them. They they made it through the whole run, and. Um, but you, another thing, do you know who was one of the stock boys at Barry and Grassmuck was? <laughs> no. Searhan Searhan. Oh, do you, well, no, because Keltner told me, well, I don't, I got to, that's going to be fascinating because, um, it's, I don't want to get into this whole story, but the night that RFK was, was, mur mm -hmm. was murdered, uh, Keltner mm -hmm. was playing an R&B gig at, uh, with Wilton Felder on bass, and and uh, it was just with it was ridiculous. Charlie Smalls, who wrote the Wiz, they were playing they were playing this gig, and and it was our, uh, uh, Robert Kennedy's uh, entourage was supposed to come to the gig after his um, speech and or his acceptance speech, or whatever, and and that was the night he was murdered. So he went back and. and Wilton's reading his Bible, and he's like, "What's going on here?" And Wilton's like, "I don't know," but they're they're watching the TV, and Keltner went in and he saw that all this going down. And when he saw the paper the next day and saw this guy's face, uh, he realized that he had been working in a natural grocery store that, and Keltner was buying food there and, and walking all, 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 all the time. So this guy had multiple jobs. It's really unbelievable. I guess so. But, uh, yeah, when I found that out, I went, wow, you know, how, <laughs> how bizarre is that? So, but let me go back. You're, 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 we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're all over the place. I, I want, you know, cause you, oh, yeah, you, well, no, you, you have a tendency. That, no, I already know. Happen. Like you have a tendency to like cut yourself short when you could expand into these incredible stories. So let's just, let's just break something down. What did the Georgiatis routine look like when you were really, really serious? Uh, what did it look like when I was really serious? Well, no, as a, as a musician, as a, I mean, we're, we're talking 20 hours a day. We're talking, I mean, how did you shed when you were a really I, yeah. serious musician? Yeah. I had a guitar going pretty much. I, you know, like those old stories you hear of these guys that walk around the house, take it into the bathroom, mm -hmm. put it in their, yeah, I did that. <laughs> I did that a lot. Um, and other things were happening too. I mean, I wasn't, you know, it was, as, as I said, it was a pretty exciting time to be coming up. A lot was happening, as you well know, certainly on the West Coast. Now, um, again, oh, how long is this thing? How long do we have? So, no, but dude, um, we, we, we are all day, man. all day. God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is set one. You didn't know what you were getting into. This is just set one. But, I mean, you know, we can, we can stretch out as much as you want. So this is live. People are hearing this. Oh, dude, is that right? worldwide. Africa, motherland, everywhere. Well... I'll try and keep it together. Just anyway. keep it together, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what was it like? It was like that. You know, a lot was going on. Music, um, it's like what, you know that guy Bob Lefsitz? You know, you know him, right? Uh. He, he has a newsletter amongst people in the industry. It, it's on. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go, we'll just keep riffing. Yeah, he has so a it's like what he talks about all the time, how music ruled, in certainly in the 60s, man, when everything exploded that's how you knew what was happening where it was happening when it was going to happen so music was extremely exciting then and uh yeah so just to be part of that on on a very small level at, at first uh it was incredible now i'm only guessing i don't know how much research you've done but <laughs> Uh, zero no zero I, I i do zero research this is all free and free association it's all spontaneous oh, so, yeah uh yeah Except, you ex you no, no, no what i what, what i really i'm just trying to focus on is this idea of you talked about this instant gratification 
of my generation as a Gen Xer, and then you have the millennials now where, you know, they we are basically told, you know, that's the thing to me, you know, where it's like now you don't have to have any talent really, and you can become yeah. a famous musician. How did I sound? Terrible. We can come up and fix it. I mean, I mean everything was predicated on you really needed to find a niche, and you had to have... A, a deep bag of tunes and you had to be a quality musician. You couldn't be a fraud. I mean, I think that that's what bothers me the most about the lack of authenticity in music is a reflection of cross all culture. If you can't detect authenticity in music, then we're, we're in serious trouble. And I just, to me, the, the, what a buzzy feet and from the Butterfield blues band, you know, one of our interviews, he said something and I, I want to get your opinion on this. He said, as opposed to having like huge facility and chops, because you know nobody's going to mistake Georgiatis for John McLaughlin. But you know, were you? How did you per- get the sound on on your guitar that you were happy with? Was that the priority for you, or was it learning facility and songs, or was it more about getting a sound that you were happy with coming out? Well, definitely that last one, and actually all of them, mm-hmm. because I. I, for some reason, early on, I was drawn to trying to write songs. I remember going to, uh, I'd go to Lacey Park in San Marino when it was when it didn't have a fence on it. It was a really beautiful little park, and I just sit in there. You know, I had a my little notebook, and I try to write these songs. And uh, but the other part of it was listening to other people, being influenced. I was very influenced early on, as early as I can remember by the Yardbirds. Uh, certainly uh, Clapton, Jeff Beck, and, and later on Jimmy Page. And uh, I just remember hearing that stuff. And when I, I got into this band called the Gross National Product in Pasadena. Are you kidding? Now, now we're starting to get somewhere. Are you kidding me, GNP? You know about that. I can't. I, no, I have, no, no, no. This is all brand new. This, this is why I tracked you down. I, I know nothing about it. Tell me about this. Go ahead, please. Oh, yeah. We, oh, uh, this is great. <laughs> this okay, is unreal. So it's really, it's that's funny. Uh, <laughs> I graduated in 64. I went to Pasadena City College, and I was studying music, uh, 65 and 66. In 1965, I got a night gig working at Lamb Ambulance because I had learned first aid. We used to, uh, some people at Pasadena High School, we used to work for the junior first aid and at the time you don't you know you don't have to be an emt or one of those paramedics it was just it's triage it was triage yeah 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 so i got this job working at lamb ambulance in pasadena and i was going to city college and i uh i worked from five in the afternoon to eight in the morning sometimes we got calls at night sometimes we didn't and then the next day was it was hell going i mean if we had three or four calls there was no sleep and anyway, I met, uh, I, I would take a guitar there, and I always had a guitar. There were, there were bunk beds, quarters for the people that worked in the ambulance. And uh, through them, I met some people that had a band. This guy, Dennis Grau, who's in Hawaii right now. Eric Chase was a bass player, and he's, he's playing music right now still. And uh, Dennis and Paul Fairweather, who, who played the drums. And that was the last iteration of that band. It started out with a couple of different guys. John uh, Borton and Richard Manderbach played in the band at first when I got in it. And then they went off and did other things. And then the four of us solidified. And that band, we played a lot of gigs. We played with an awful lot of people. We opened for The Doors in Las Vegas. In wow. Six, yeah. Hold on. Wait, wait hold on. You, you, this, this, this is from the Lamb Ambulance Society? This band came out of that? No, 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 no. I was just working there where I met people that went, oh, you, you play guitar. Hey, I know these guys in South Pasadena, man, oh, and they're really good. Wow. Uh, you meet these guys. And it was, you know, as you said, there are no coincidences. <laughs> here I am. Here I am. I have this horrendous gig right. at Lamb right. Ambulance. Right, right, right. I mean, it was idiots. You can't believe the stuff I saw at 19 years old. But anyway, so it was through that, and I went down to South Pasadena. I met these guys. It was just instant. Dennis was a, a, is an amazing uh, musician. 
And for years, he moved to Hawaii, and he, he was in Don Ho's band. And wow, wow. Just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant keyboard player and an orchestrator. And, you know, we were a good little band. And anyway, we played a lot of things around. We, we were pretty well known around, you know, the Southland as far as little up-and-coming bands and, and things. I mean, we played at the Civic with Love, Pasadena Civic Auditorium, and just all, all kinds of stuff. Anyway. No, I, I'm curious. It, I just want to, how did you, when you, when, when you um, found your way into GNP, I mean, how, how did they get, I'm just curious about how they connected with, to be able to, so you guys actually were able to get gigs. I mean, how did that happen? How was that possible? Well, it's like, you know, at first there was, uh, there was the odd gig. Well, one, one thing, just reminded me of something. Uh, Dennis Grau used to live above. He lived in this cliff, and down below was South Pasadena High School. <laughs> and uh, the football team would be out there, and the cheerleaders would be out there. And we would be practicing in his basement. He had kind of a rec room downstairs in his house, kind of a long room, and it was, it was fine. And we'd open up all the doors and try to get the cheerleader, the girls and stuff, to, you know come to the end of the football field and kind of look up and stuff and we'd wave at him. Absolutely. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I just thought of something else. At one point, uh, Kenny Loggins used to come over and I remember, I didn't know him all that well, but he used to, would come over and listen to us rehearse and he'd be sitting in the corner on, you know, with his back against the wall and his <laughs> knees up with his arms around his knees, just listening because he's a Pasadena guy. And, uh, and just for the record, I just know that he didn't even have a guitar when he first met Jim Messina. So he was just taking it all in. He wasn't even playing. Oh, yeah, yeah, he was. And, and he, yeah, he would come and listen to, you know, us rehearse and stuff. And then we played gigs. We'd play all, you know, wherever we could. We got a manager at first, and, and this guy was, uh, he worked for an aerospace uh, company, which was amazing. I think he worked for Rocket Dine or something like that. <laughs> And this guy really loved our band, and uh, he he tried to get us gigs. And then from there, there was another guy that came on the scene who really did know how to get things happening. And he teamed up with a guy named Forrest Hamilton, who was Chico Hamilton's son. Uh, I, you, I, you need to st- – because, again, this is how deep it's gone – uh, yeah, Gabriel, Gra- uh, Kenny Gradney, well, Kenny Kenny's brother Gabriel worked with Forrest Hamilton, and and there's these little known Chico Hamilton records with Little Feet from '73. I've, I've vetted the whole. I can't believe you dropped. That was all Stax Records and stuff. He was the head of Stax. Oh, oh man, see, I don't know any of that. All I know is when we played the uh, Forrest Hamilton. Show. So we hold on. I just want to be clear. You got hooked up with Forrest Hamilton. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Absolutely. And the, uh, his partner at the time, the guy that was managing us after the Rocket Dine guy was a guy named Tom Nieto, N-I-E-T-O. And uh, he's no longer with us. I don't think Forrest is either. Is he's, he's, Forrest, he's, is, he's, Forrest has left us, yeah. Right. Uh, and, those guys, and he um, was managing us, and he got us gigs. Then we got the uh, Las Vegas gig, opening for the doors. Gross national product on the bottom of the bill, the Hamilton streetcar, which was managed by Forrest Hamilton, go figure, <laughs> and then the doors. That was the gig. Uh, and we went and played that, and that's a whole other story. I, I think we're going to run out of time here if I really keep going with all these. We're, we're, uh, we have, we, uh, there, listen, man, there's, listen, we are, at, there's, we are not breaking for anything. We have plenty of, this is not, like, this is not cor- stuck in six. 66, 67. Yeah, no, we're, no I mean, what I'm saying is this is really good because already you're, you're, you're remembering things that you have probably have not thought about in a long time, which is really important. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is great. Yeah, for, no, uh, just, we're just roll, man. I mean, you just, we're just getting going here. But I guess, you know, the, at that point, like, the, is the, with your drummer, I'm always curious, like, was, it a, was it a folk rock? I hate labels. No, no. What no, kind of, what kind of music was it? Well, we used to play. Well, we wrote songs. We that was a, a, you know, that was one of our things. It was we played our own material, and we'd do covers for you know 
at first we played a few uh, frat parties at UCLA. We'd play the odd whatever it was, and we'd have to play stuff that was happening. We could play we could play door song. Uh, Dennis was a genius on the keyboard. He could play Ray's part on any door song. Really? And I could play Robbie's stuff, and Paul and and Eric could play, and it was great. Um, so. Yeah. I don't Wait, know. hold on. The no, limit you got was uh, was Dennis kicking. Was he playing left hand bass? Did you have a bass player in the band? Bass player. So he didn't have to do that. He just he would just play. he could. He actually could. He could, and right? He was amazing. Yeah, he's in Hawaii right now. He's still. He's no, because I listen. I'm going to get to every one of these cats because we're this we're going to be vetting the entire Pasadena scene at this point. But it's like because. Well, no, let me tell you something, Jake. Go ahead. There's a thing. There's a thing. They contact they this this. <laughs> <laughs> website called 60sgaragebands.com. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, mm-hmm. but it's an amazing little site. I, I haven't seen it in years, but this guy got a hold of this, the, the head of this thing. It's like 60 apostrophe s garagebands.com. And he found us and he said, Hey, man, I want to do a whole thing on the gross national product. And for some reason, I was the guy. Well, I know the reason. I've, I've always tried to keep um, all memorabilia, all, everything. I've got a lot of stuff. You're a hoarder, yeah. Well, for that stuff. No, I dig, I dig. <laughs> it's all good. Well, it's it's all good. For, for, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he got a hold of us, and I hadn't talked to Dennis in, in years. Uh, wow. Pa- I made I, I remained friends with Paul uh, to this day, and, you know, we hung out. You want to hear another story about Dennis? That is Listen, I, I, I want I want you to you do not need to preface you you my there are no questions. Whatever I ask you, wherever it takes you, you don't have to ask permission. You just go. Yeah, I think you're going to start hearing the sound of radios or whatever people listen on radio. People are having a ball right now. No, this is internet. This is full. See, people are having a ball. Click. If you're going to hear you're going to hear however many people listen to this thing the sound of radios being clicked off anyway, it's a listen we're, we're just it's like the first set you know you're just trying to get into a groove you know well dude check this out because this truly is amazing <laughs> i move I, i've got to jump up now to jump back okay go ahead i moved to topanga at the end of 1970 maybe the beginning of 71 and i'd been up here and paul and i were always we had lost contact with dennis and we were always going yeah i wonder what dennis this is before the internet and uh we just had ah, it'd be great to get a hold of him. We had no idea where he was. And in 19, oh my, let's see, what would this be? Probably, it had to be in the 90s. It had to be, could have been early 2000s, but I think it was in the 90s. Uh, I've been living up here in Topanga, and I go down to the store one day. This guy, this, this, what? look to be a homeless guy and he's just sitting in front of the store and he's got a big bottle of Colt what 40 what is it Colt 45 Colt 45 yeah and he's just sitting there and he's he looks kind of like a really scruffy sur- uh, surfer guy right well there's many of those cats around there oh yeah, yeah. especially out here because yeah. I'm only a couple miles from the beach into, I don't know if you know this area well no I was just at Val Garay's house so I'm like I'm coming to see Georgiatis the next time I'm out there go ahead continue yeah well yeah okay Anyway, so um, I walk by this guy, and he looks up at me. He's, you know, sitting on the ground with his back against the, the wall. I told this story to the guy at 60s Garage Band. It's, it's in print, but I'll tell you because uh, lots happened since then. Well, and also, let's be clear. With new media, I mean, print is one thing, but this stuff is beyond, and will go into all different vectors once you put it out on new media. So go ahead. Yeah, so this guy looks up at me and he's just surly he goes i know you like that and i just look down at him and i go you do and I'm thinking, <laughs> right, here, we, here, here we go with this right okay right he goes i i know you it, just really low voice i know you and i go really who am i he said you played guitar in the gross national product now this is 30 years later, of course, and I stopped dead in my tracks. Man. Oh, my God. This is eerie. And I'm looking at the guy, and I go, how do you know How do you know me? How do you recognize me? He looks, and he goes, you don't look all that much different. And I go, who are you, man? He says, well, I'm just some guy I used to 
come to your gigs. And I go, the next thing out of my mouth, I go, where's Grau? Do you know where Dennis is? He goes, yeah, he's in Hawaii. And I go, he is. He says, yeah, you can find him. So I said, all right, man, thanks. Thanks a lot. Wow. Went in the store. What a shaman that cat out. was. I have no idea who it was. I never saw him again, ever. <laughs> ever. So we found, I think this was 97, 96, 97. Yeah, pre-internet, just before the internet started to get going, yeah. Yeah, there was no way to do it that way. So anyway, somehow or another, maybe through the phone book, I told Paul about this, Paul Fairweather, and he goes, yeah, we gotta, he said, we got to go over there. I said, well, I can't go over there. He says, well, I'm going over there. So he goes over there, he finds, finds Growl. He actually found it. And Eric Chase was living over there at the same time. So Eric and Dennis stayed friends, and I stayed friends with Paul. So then the uh, 60s garage band guy gets a hold of us. I pull out all these. But you should go there and check it out if you're interested, uh, Jake, if the site still exists. I, I, I swear to God, I don't know if it does. When did he when, when, does, how, how So when, let me ask you, when, when Fairweather went over there, how, how quickly did the four of you reconnect or only was and then or how quickly did this garage band journalist come come about after that uh that i believe happened in around 2000 2006 probably uh that started happening and i got a hold of dennis and i got a hold of eric and i sent them pictures and stuff that i've had for years that they'd never seen and uh I got them to give, you know, their story. So each each one of the four of us has our recollection of what it was like, what happened, what it's like, you know, to to quote a famous thing. Uh, yeah. So so that's how that happened with with that. Uh, well, I guess the the, the uh, I mean, my my first question. I mean, you're on you're playing with with love and. You're on the road with the oh, doors. By, by the way, Manzarek, what's what's amazing is in, in the studio, they had to bring in Harvey Brooks and Ray Neapolitan and all these cats because uh, there wasn't enough punch on the Hammond B3 bass. Uh, he wasn't kicking pedals. He was just playing left-hand bass. Um, so there wasn't enough punch on the studio. They had to bring in an electric bass player. But um, I need to know, uh, GNP, why, wow. now what happened... Uh, right. Was there a record? De- was the was there a record to... deal on? Well, how close? Were, I'm looking up. There's normally you find some sort of crazy psychedelic track that uh, somebody ripped off. Now how? Now what happened? Were you in the studio? And what did it fall apart? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you exactly what happened. And I kind of regret it because I, I don't regret it because things happen the way they're you know. There are no coincidences. Yeah. It's a it's a natural progression. <laughs> Rotation. And at that point, Tom Nieto and Forrest Hamilton decided to kind of team up and be co-managers of. And they said to me, "You know what? You really, you you really ought to join the Hamilton Streetcar. They're going places. They have a deal with Lee Hazelwood." You know what that is. Absolutely. Sure. Well, I, I've seen him with the was it reprise uh, with Nancy. Uh, that's the only way I know him from. Well, no, he had LHI Records, Lee Hazelwood, you know, records. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Yes. There's a box. There's, there's a, a box set that just came out. It's it's amazing. They've got the Hamilton Street Car. There's there's a picture of me playing with them. Um, anyway, um, so they said, yeah, you you really should join the Hamilton Street Car. They their guitar player is taking some time off we they don't know what he's going to do or i went oh well and that's what i did and i'll tell you um that's what happened to the gross national vibe they went on and they did other stuff they got another guitar player and uh, i went off with the with the hamilton streetcar and the very first song that i ever had properly recorded in a studio was a song that I wrote with uh, a couple of guys in that band called Confusion. You can you can see that it's that's on YouTube. And uh, Lee Lee Hazelwood produced it. And when we were cutting it, Nancy Sinatra happened to be sitting in the booth with him because he was working with her. And that was a, that was a wild kind of a wild deal. Well, and you know, but, but you that- know, before we go on, because the audience is clamoring to hear some of we're we're talking to a decorator. 
How do you know that? I, I, because I'm getting messages from people on Facebook because this oh. is streaming worldwide. But the, the let, let's take we're talking to an incredible songwriter and a great singer. So let's take a listen to to this tune that uh, Mr. Georgiatis was just referring to, and then we'll come back and break it down. You're just hung up by the words that you use. Music on the Jake Feinberg Show brought to you by Abbott Taylor Jewelers, Dr. Diggs of Butch Diggs Dental, Craig Pretzinger of Allstate Insurance, the Bialy Winery Vineyards in Napa Valley, and the Jewish Community Center of Southern Arizona, and we thank them for their support so we can play epic. I mean, okay, so, you know, I thought, it's funny because when you said you left GNP, I thought, the Hamilton streetcar was just going to f- fell apart right away when you joined. But in fact, you did, that was your first collaboration of songwriting. Is that correct? That got recorded. And I'd, I'd written stuff with, uh, with, uh, you know, the, uh, gross national product. We, as I said, we did original material, which kind of set us apart in those days, you know, all the little garage bands that were coming up and all the, you know, bands that were trying to be the Beatles and every and anybody in between, they they were doing a lot of covers. There weren't a whole lot of. Uh, well, I guess there were people. That were there were no. You know, you keep reminding me of like uh, the GNP reminds me of like Earl, like Tim Buckley when he wound up meeting the cats. That uh, you know, I, I just want to go back. Did 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 you guys before you got pulled into the streetcar? Did you guys, because you had all this original material, did you, did you ever come close to getting into the studio? And, and, and the subset to that is, do you have an analog soundboard of any of your live, any, any live GNP? Go to that, 60sgaragebandcom Okay. Sound, when you say soundboard, I think we, what we have are rehearsal tapes, and that's the only thing that exists. And I believe it's... Um, Wow. There are songs uh, before Paul got in the band. It was uh, John Borton and Richard Manderbach. And uh, I had this reel-to-reel that I started learning Pro Tools in the uh, late 90s. And one of, one of the ways I did it was I had all the stuff. I had cassettes. I had reel-to-reel stuff because... I kind of knew intuitively, let's just say, that uh, the stuff wouldn't exist if I didn't caretake it. Somehow. Well, it was smart. Very, very. That was very prophetic of you, actually. It's true. I mean, that's that. Otherwise, it would have just been a talk with the spirits. But you're saying that you have. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, it's on there. You can go online, and I uh, gave those guys. Uh, you know, I sent Dennis and and the rest of them. Um, I I guess they're. Wave files or AIFF files or something. Anyway, I sent those to the to the guy at Sixties Garage Bands, and he, on the site, I also sent him pictures of the posters that we had, the the Doors posters. Some of those are real classic um, posters. Well, I mean, I and they're yeah. on that. Yeah. But if you want to go to SixtiesGarageBands.com, if if it's still there and if we're still on it, I I, I we may be. 
I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I just, it, I mean, I just punched in. I don't see it, but you know, that's listen. That guy, he was, he did his thing. I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. But, the, but the idea is that, like with elect, like I just with Buckley, they wound up going up one night, and and the mothers were playing up there. Zappa was playing, and that's it, all of a sudden Herb Cohen or somebody was like, whose songs are these? I mean, he had like thirty songs, he, and Buckley's like, they're all mine. And next yeah. thing you know, they're in Electra. And I'm like, well, if he, they were on the road with the Doors, that was a boutique label. It sounds to me like, ooh, I mean, you never really, you felt like you just were not going to get in the studio. That's one reason you might have left at that point. Yeah, maybe. Well, yeah, I suppose so. It was just one of those situations where it just seemed like the sort of the next indicated thing. Um, looking back, that that the GNP those guys were really 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 they had skills. I don't I don't use the word talent very much. I, I I'm not sure what that is, and it seems to be kind of meaningless because a lot of people with incredible talent don't do anything. You're 100 percent right. You are 100 percent right, man. It's just skills. Uh, you know, you develop. When you were asking me about what I did coming up, yeah, I just honed it you know, a little bit as much as I could, as as much as my quote unquote talent would allow and uh yeah uh, that that's just the way that worked what what did you uh, like like you know I, i've been you know prepping a little bit just sort of trying to find as much georgiatis material as possible and uh i mean it's mercurial to say the least uh you just hit me to this this hamilton street car um but like can you just talk step back and and and, and talk about uh, the germ of a song, where where these songs come from. A lot of your stuff deals with uh, atmosp- atmospherics. A lot of it deals with, um, uh, there's a lot of different themes, but can you talk about ultimately early on how you learned, how how, how you crafted tunes? Well, looking back on it, I mean, here, here's where we really may put everybody to sleep. No, but, people are having a good... Dude, do you I, stop with the self-deprecation. I gotta, I gotta say, really looking back on it, the way I try to do it, I heard John Lennon said it years after the Beatles, I guess. Somebody said, well, how do you write a song? And I've never he- heard anybody say it better than this. <laughs> right. And it's really the truth. He said, just tell the truth and make it rhyme. And... It's like, what? That's awesome, man. <laughs> tell the truth and make crime. Yeah, that's, but that, you know, telling the truth, look, we're in this age of, of complete fake, fake news. I mean, it's telling the truth. So tell me when you, to, tell me when you, can you give an example of a tune you wrote, whether it was with Rivers or, or Leaden or when you, when you, when you, when it all came together, I mean, when you told the truth. <laughs> well, I'll have to, yeah. Uh, when I told the truth. Well, I really don't know how to answer that. I, I'd have to really cut him off. You know something, Jake? I'll tell you seriously, a lot of the stuff that I think is great that's been recorded, a lot of it is unreleased. A lot of that's out there. I think well, I'm, I'm sorry, you just what, what do you mean by, what do you mean by that? You, specifically stuff that you've written or just in general, stuff's not released. I'm talking about unreleased stuff. You, you're asking me about what songs really highlight. Oh, I think uh, Half a million angels, but of course that was written in the late '90s. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, talk. So tell me. I mean, just only because you you were inspired by that Lennon quote, and I just want you to back it up and personalize it for the audience. Well, it's it's all been about truth, man. It's it, there's just not it's not separate. It's not like well, you know, my whole life is trying to be, you know, trying to figure out the universe. Really, you know. Forgive me, I don't even want to get too... No, I want you to go there. I, this is where... I go. Stop cutting but, yourself but it's off. A, it's always been about that. You know, I did that stint with, with the streetcar. I went to UCLA a little bit after that because uh, I, got, uh, I got tired of the whole kind of early... The drug scene, for sure. I didn't, you know, get too tired of it for a while right but well, you guys uh, were rolling joints i mean i you know you guys were out at, at neil young's old house rolling joint i mean be, be, whatever it's a that people were in true yeah oh the, your yeah. The album cover yeah the, the, the greatest album i mean i was like these guys i'm like just get me back there the year before i was well, birthed you know yeah unreal that's the whole thing that's you know gary burden and henry dills 
those guys were incredible guys, man. Uh, well, are well, Gary passed recently, but um, yeah, that was an amazing period. But I'm I'm jumping all over the place. I feel like we're I'm having a ball. No, we're, no, listen. All I'm saying is that I, like explain with that one with the Angels tune in the '90s. What what connected? What was truthful about it in your per, natural progression? I mean, just 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 personalize. Well, it was just it was a. Oh, man, you'd have to hear the song. That's all I can tell you, man. That, this stuff is, I know it's going to come off as being kind of a dud interview guy, but it, you just have to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Dude, we're, you know, we, dude like, this is, we're, we haven't even, we're, 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 this is just set one. I don't know what you're talking about, dude. You got to stop. I don't, oh, it, it may be set one and done, but <laughs> we'll see. Here, you, I, know. you know, we have a game on this. I mean, pro- there's really not, yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to kind of, recount a few things that may be of interest to you I guess. well no but here what i'm trying to get at is this so many musicians contort themselves to popularize themselves and they're untruthful to who they really are you said that well, this lenin quote was inspiring yeah. to you and yeah. really simply all i'm saying is just take one of your tunes obviously you've been trying to live uh, a- okay i can i can do it in a different way okay mm-hmm. i'll do it a little differently uh, when I started hanging out with Bernie, he was in the Burrito Brothers. And uh, stuff was really happening in the early 70s. And I got through being around those guys, and uh, Geffen was involved with it, but I got signed to Warner Brothers Music as a songwriter. Uh, that was the day they had the huge publishing company. You know, Jackson was with them, all the Eagles, Judy Sill, uh uh, Alan O'Day, all these guys, and you know, and they were songwriters, kind of like the West Coast version, maybe of the Brill Building. And I was writing stuff with Bernie. I was doing stuff with Johnny Rivers, uh, and I was writing the kind of songs I was writing, which were, I guess, not easily placed. Like they'd have these meetings, they'd send out these flyers. Here's who's cutting it. It would be about five pages. Art Garfunkel, uh, on and on. I mean, everybody that you know of. And and the song guys, the runners and stuff, would have uh, these printouts of who's cutting, who's in the studio. You know, Richard Perry's doing this. Uh, you know, so-and-so. Every name that you could possibly even think of or drop. And uh, I wasn't really one of those kind of songwriters. And they... To their credit, man, it was an incredible opportunity because I would, I was with them for eight years as a songwriter, from 72 to 80, and the head of it was Ed Silvers, who was an incredible guy, and Mel Bly was right underneath him, and these, it was an incredible place. It was right on Sunset Boulevard, just as you're coming into Beverly Hills. I think it was the 9200 90, building, maybe the 9200, uh, I think. And it was the whole second floor, and I'd go in there, and we'd go to lunch, and uh, it was just a great thing. So they would leave me alone because they knew I was independently, uh, and they didn't ever pressure me like, hey, man, you've got to come up with some songs for so-and-so. I'd, I'd you know, write stuff, uh, maybe do a demo of it at the house. I had a Kiak 4-track at the time, so did Bernie, and, you know, we'd knock stuff out and play together. And you know, of course, he was starting the Eagles then. Well, I, I don't. I want. I don't want to listen. What? What? What songs you know, did you? Did, did, so like, first of all, you're. Stuff. First of all, you just caught fire there. I, I mean, so this is not a dud interview. But I just want to be honest. Which? <laughs> which? I mean, which? Which? Yeah. Which Burrito Brothers songs did you work on uh, in the year before? None. The, before none. I'll I'll tell you what happened with that. Okay. I was living in in Topan Canyon. I had just moved down there. Uh, I was, well, I had moved to Hawaii, and then I came back at the end of 1970. And uh, I met a girl up in Santa Barbara. We moved down to Topanga, got a little house. One day, I was in the house playing my guitar. I had my little TAC four-track studio and, <laughs> not, you know, good stuff, Macintosh amps and all that kind of thing. So the sound was pretty good. Anyway, one day, I'm sitting in there in this, in this alcove that we had, and I'm playing uh, my little Martin D28, and I hear this banjo playing off in the distance, and it's insane. And I'm thinking, what is that? So I go to the kitchen door, and it had a window in it, 
and I see my girlfriend walking with this guy who's got a banjo on, <laughs> and they're walking the distance toward the house. And I'm thinking, this is, and he's just wailing away, wailing. Oh, man. And he's got odd off jeans and, you know, some t shirt or something. And I open the door and I go, hey. And uh, Julie was her name. Uh, says, Michael, this is our next door neighbor. This is Bernie. This is Bernie Ledden. I go, hey, Bernie. How you doing, man? <laughs> hey, Bernie. <laughs> oh, great. You know, and I met him. So I said, yeah, come on in. So um, he comes in, and I offer him something. He says, well, you know, um, I'm in a band, and we're playing a noon concert at UCLA. Now, I've known him at the most 10 minutes. <laughs> and he goes, you guys want to go? I went, yeah, sure. <laughs> I said, what's your band? He goes, uh, we're called the Flying Burrito Brothers. I go, oh, cool. It's a noon concert outside wow. at UCLA. Wow. It turns out that, uh, you know, it was with Graham and Chris Etheridge, Chris Hillman, um, and so on, and Sneaky Pete and Michael Clark, I believe. Yeah. And we went to that concert, and that's what happened. And... Uh, a short amount of time after that, I know Bernie came up to us. He said, "Hey, man, I just played with some guys, and I think we're going to do. Uh, it, I think it's going to be pretty good. I think we're going to. We just did a rehearsal, and I think. And of course, you know what band that was. It was the Eagles? But that's but, uh, yeah. But but Mike. But I guess what I'm getting at is, I didn't do anything with the Burrito Brothers. You, yeah, so, no, so so but 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 you when you got signed as a songwriter. Uh, yeah. By the way. Was the Brill Building still cooking the groove when when you were writing songs? Because or, or, that, that seemed like it was earlier, right? It was like George Clinton was there in the 50s and stuff. I kind of like that. It was that atmosphere. You had a bunch of songwriters, some of which were artists. I remember Kim Carnes was mm-hmm. there. Right. She was, Alan O'Day made a record called Undercover Angel, I think. Is, is that right? I don't know. Um, and there were other artists there. There was a guy named David Blue. He was with Electro Asylum. Are you kidding me? Judy of course, Hill. yeah. I mean, no, but I'm, uh, this is my question: When you were hired, essentially, you were writing lyrics, and they and and then they'd say, "Well, this might work for this artist," or, or were you writing? Speci- I was, uh, no, I was writing songs. I wasn't writing. I was writing songs, lyrics, and music. Let me just tell you another thing, because you brought up Tim Buckley. When I came down right before I moved to Topanga, my friend Paul, who was the drummer of the Gross National Product, lived. Uh, in Laguna, he had uh, his parents had a house down there, and they weren't there, so I needed a place. So I went down there, and I stayed, I think, with him for two or three months down in Laguna. Well, right next door, Tim Buckley lived, <laughs> literally house next door. <laughs> and one day, I don't know what we were doing, but you know, he had his drum set up in his house, and I had a guitar, and we were playing. And somehow or another, we we decided to go over there. And we went over to Tim Buckley's house in Laguna Beach, and the first thing we noticed is the house is painted black. The house is black. The inside of the we house. Knocked. The inside of the house. Or the outside. No, no, no. The outside. The, and this uh, is Laguna Beach, so you, you've <laughs> got to figure it with. <laughs> Tone black. We look inside, and the walls are black. And, um, on, and we just went, oh, hi, uh, yeah, we're next door. And he was cool. He was like, yeah, okay, well, cool. And we just want to say hi, and that's it. And we said, you know, well, have a good day. <laughs> but that's that story. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that, and that cool. guy, he was, he was probably tripping out on some LSD. Dude, yeah, really tripping. There was that. So anyway, I was down in Laguna, and uh, Bernie and I had, uh, let's see, was that? I'm trying to get the chronology of this. Anyway, uh Bernie was already starting with the Eagles and stuff, and I needed, he, I was writing songs with him. We had written a few things and demoed them. And, uh, Can we get the names of those things? I mean, I am chomping at the bit to know what this, I mean, I need to know the lead and Gio, Georgiotis. I mean, it take, uh, you know, I, it take me some time to, <laughs> to figure out what they are. We have, uh, we, yeah, we wrote stuff. There's a song on L.A. Reggae that uh, Rivers covered. It's a song that Bernie and I wrote called Life is a Game. That's actually on jo- the song that uh, Rock and Ammonia and the Boogie Wo- Woogie Flu. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was on L.A. Reggae. And by the way, Larry Carlton and Dean Parks sort of, I don't know if they made their debut there, but they were the guitar players on that record. Jim Gordon played drums on that record. 
Uh, well, you kidding me? One of my one of my main men, Michael O'Marty, and played piano on that too. He certainly did. Freaking and love those amazing. guys, man. I mean, that's the other thing. Man, Rivers is a whole other a whole other thing. I yeah. This is. I, I mean, again, we have set two. I mean, this is. We're not going to rush yeah. through this. But I'm just. What I'm curious about is. Uh, I wish you could edit this because no, 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 no. Listen, you're going to get a raw copy of this. Where whatever you want. This is. I actually, I think that you're being incredibly self-critical. This is actually an incredibly lucid interview. And in most of my interviews, when you listen to them, they're not linear. There's nothing more stale than a linear interview. But I'm just oh. what, what I'm trying to get at is like the even when you got hired by the by Warner Brothers. I just want to mm-hmm. be when 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 you were writing songs, you were you were writing the whole enchilada, but was it mm-hmm. was it for specific artists or would they then pair the song with people they thought might be a good fit? Well, that's what I was I clumsily trying to explain is they knew that I was working with Bernie and Rivers was doing my stuff, so they kind of left me alone. I didn't have the sort of mainstream kind of songs because this goes back to what kind of stuff were you writing you were trying to write truthful songs whatever that is i'm not even sure right I mean, right, right. I don't want to authentic take authentic you, authentic I don't want to take you or myself into some some non-existent corner here right. talking about yeah it's just songs man you know that's yeah. songs and uh but i didn't fit the mold of at, the, at least at that time i was just doing different stuff but then again uh you know i wrote the B side of, of uh, what do you call that? Uh, Rock and pneumonia. I wrote that with Rivers. We were involved in the George McGovern campaign of 1972, and that was a whole thing. Oh, shit. And uh, we we wrote a song called "Come Home America," which was his tag. Dude, I just listened to that this morning on side. Sick, very short. Such a great track, dude. Love it so much. So, I'll tell you one thing. Rivers is is brilliant in the studio. Rivers always surrounded himself with the very best of people and i gotta tell you man that guy when i got back from hawaii i met him through other people at a party and i don't i guess he found out i played or something or other he said yeah let's get together sometime here we go i'm gonna jump to that now oh my god I can't seem to stay on track. Dude, you're doing i'm gonna have to edit out all these self-apologies i'm tired of this stuff you're doing fantastic no, no, we're having a ball. Go ahead. All right. Well, where do you want to go? What do you want okay, to do? Okay, well, we I mean, have a game on this. Pro- Again, you, you've been jumping around, but we're going to even jump even. I, we, I want, I, we have a game on this program called Name That Voice. Um, this, is yeah. how, this is how long Georgiatis has been on my radar. I want you to take a listen to this voice, uh, listen to the content, and then we'll come back and break it down. I did work with Glenn, yeah. Could you talk about with, could you talk about working with him? Yeah, Glenn uh That's a Glenn hired me first That's drummers on earth, right do, there. I know who that is. Bernie Ledden was a original member of the Eagles. And um and he left the Eagles and we were doing his first solo album, which was uh he had a partner, Michael Georgiatis. So, and Glenn was a friend. What's that? Leo Sayer. Leo Sayer was the name of the other. I got, okay, right on, right on. Okay. Thank you, Norma. <laughs> Norma. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so Bernie, we were doing his first solo album, and it was uh, with a partner, Michael Georgiatis, and Glenn Johns had done the first Eagles album. And so Bernie and Glenn were good pals. And so Glenn called me himself, said, hello, it's Glenn Johns. And I just, I mean, I had been in love with Glenn. I hadn't met him, but I loved everything he'd done that I'd heard. I mean, my God. And he asked me to do Bernie's first record, and he was going to engineer it and produce it, co-produce it with Bernie. And... We were going to do it at Bernie's house. Bernie had bought Neil Young's house in Topanga Canyon, and it had a recording studio in in the basement. And so he put a band together. Brian Garofalo was one of the guys. And uh, I think 
I think that was it. He was, so yeah, I, I heard you yelling there that you knew who that was. Uh, and so why don't you why don't you tell us who yeah, that is? I knew it in the first second, man. I love I love David Cameron. Well, I first of all, I want to read you the because we went and wound up going into um, we wound up uh, going into the uh, the track uh, calling for your love. But when we came back, this is what he said, and I want you to comment on it. He said. Um, it was very loose. We were in his house, Bernie's house. There wasn't an hourly rate going by. Uh, we were all friends. We became great friends. That was my first experience with Bernie. There were many more to come. Bernie's a dear friend. Glenn's a dear friend. Michael Georgiatis became a great friend. It's the way I prefer to record. And he really talked about Glenn. I mean, one thing that's inspiring about that record to me is there is an open feel to it. And this is what this is what David said. He goes, Glenn got a great sound. It was real open. Not He didn't use a lot of mics on the drums. Pretty much a bass drum mic and a right and left stereo overhead. He knew where to put the mics and he would get a great sound. And what I've learned on this journey talking to cats, it's not digital versus analog. It's about mic placement, period. Uh -huh. And yeah. that record is... You want to talk about authenticity, it stands the test of time. But I want, you know, I mean, Kemper, that's when you first, that was my interview with him from October 2014. So, I mean, I've been on this trek for a while, and now I finally tracked down uh, Georgiatis. And I, in, your, in your mind, did you, did you, um, can you just comment a little bit about the, the idea of, I know you're not a, you know, you know, decorated, known as a decorated producer or, uh, engineer but it's like can you talk about the the warm sound that that could be attained from uh, yeah. Johnny Rivers records and and these records you were on and and how it has to do with mic placement as opposed to anything related to digital versus analog recording well yeah I mean a analog recording is very warm and uh, again I was very fortunate to be around some guys that just uh, it, it was an amazing experience. Uh, Rivers had the wrecking crew. I got to play with an awful lot of those different guys. And just going back to Dave, I'd love to hear that. Where's that interview? I'd like to hear that thing. Oh, I'm going to send you the whole, uh, well, you, yeah, I will send you, you're going to, I'm going to inundate you with interviews. You're going to be having a ball. Kemper's for sure. And I heard Norma in the background. I love Norma. I did an interview Norma. with Norma. Norma's great. He couldn't remember who he was playing with. She was just feeding him. Norma was doing work with Jerry Peters from Blue Note. I mean, that, with Donald Byrd, and it's how badass she was, you know. But that amazing, yeah. amazing human being, and a brilliant human being. She's so, she's done everything. Uh, she's amazing. It's just great to hear those guys. And David is uh, one of. I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but truly, he's one of the best drummers in the world, in my opinion. I've had the most creative output. Uh, whether the two of us would set up and he just played drums. There was a time, here we go again, here I go, okay. Uh, after this thing that we did at Bernie's, um, David, I had a little thing set up downstairs and David uh, brought his drums and uh, Lon Van Eaton, there was a, uh, he and his brother, Lon and Derek were the uh, first two, they're brothers. And they were signed to Apple Records. I think they were the first people to be signed to Apple. I think that's true. And uh, Lon was very good friends with Klaus because he was around all those guys when they cut their record in 68. Paul McCartney played on it. George Harrison produced one of their songs. Anyway, uh, by some miracle, I was introduced to Klaus, and we hit it off, and he came up here, and we cut probably, I want to say, five or six things. As I said, some of the best stuffs uh, in the can just never came out. And David played drums on it, and it was, um, yeah. Wait, 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 where, I mean, you, and being being someone that hangs on to this stuff, you have it? Are you in possession of it? I do. I do. Holy crap. Uh, was it like then, late 60s? So what year is this? Oh, no, no, it's late 70s. That'd be 78, oh. 79. Oh, we got it. What happened Kemper after, is, yeah, go ahead. After we, did the re after we did the record of Bernie's house, Bernie built that studio. Neil Young had it, and then Bernie bought the house from Gary Burden, who had bought the house from uh, Neil. So Bernie gutted the studio, 
jackhammered it out so it would be bigger. It was the house is, you know, it's a big three-story redwood house built it on rock. Anyway, he uh, gutted the place and built the studio to Glenn, Glenn's specs. The way Glenn wanted to work, the board, the monitors, the outboard gear, the tape machines, it was like kind of like Olympic, you know, West Coast. Absolutely. Man, that's pushing it a little bit. But, uh, yeah, Olympic is another story, I can tell you. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So, anyway, that's what happened. And then uh, Bernie, uh, we cut some demos over here. Uh, I was hanging out with uh, Linda, Linda's brother, Michael Ronstadt, who unfortunately left us way too soon, about a year and a half ago or so. And, and most and of those I, cats, Michael's, most of that family lives in south, southern Arizona, too. I'm in Tucson, so I, they live around um, here. I didn't realize he passed. Are, right? I didn't realize he passed. Oh, uh, sorry to break the news to you on a radio interview, but yeah, Michael was a, a beautiful, beautiful soul. And somehow or another, we just teamed up. It was after the Linda tour that Bernie, Bernie and I opened that summer of 77. We went around the country, and she still holds, Linda still holds the, I believe she still holds the uh, record at playing at Universal when it was still open. It was, you know, the hillside, and it was open. Right. She still holds the record. We played there 13 nights which was a whole other deal. But anyway, Michael and I, uh, he engineered a, a lot of stuff and helped me get it together. And then Bernie decided to go over to Hawaii. He had met this uh, girl and fell in love and decided to go over to Hawaii. And he said, why don't you guys just take the studio, hear the keys, go do what you're doing. So we had, you know, run of that studio, and that's where we cut a lot of, you know, all those things that are, Theoretically, uh, I've got the uh, s some of that stuff. And but, that's um, amazing. And so, I mean, but, uh, you know, for that session, I mean, at that point, Bernie was, um, like Kemper was saying, there was no real, it was very loose. There was no commitment to studio hours or paying people for, I mean, how, what, what, the budget. Well, was I mean, I, when you say it's loose, I don't know if you know much about Glenn Johns. And I don't know if you've ever been around him. Never. But he's not exactly the loosest guy in the world when it comes to any of this kind of stuff. I mean, he's a real serious guy, and we were real serious. It was loose. I, I'm, you know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? When I say mean loose, I mean that I felt like you guys, even though you guys are not, no one would mistake you for serious melodic improvisers, but you were leaving the head of the tune and jamming. So it, it felt dude, it felt loose. That's all I'm saying. Dude, just look at the album cover. Look at the back of the album. We're having a ball. I'm, dude, that's all I want. I just want to be there. But, you know, I want to be where you are. You know, that's just sick. Yes, it was incredible, man. It was a great, uh, it was a great experience. Yeah, I mean, there's no other way of saying it. And, and being with those guys, Stephen Goldstein, another guy that passed, brilliant keyboard player, and Garofalo, who is amazing, and, of course, yeah, that rhythm section was incredible. Well, another woman, the, the, the most beautiful Miss Bobby Hall, too, on percussion. I've interviewed her. She's the best. And I got to work with her, of course, on River stuff. Uh, because, again, he would just keep hiring the best there was. Uh, and, I, you know, we did quite a lot of stuff together in the uh, 70s. We did stuff together in the 80s. Um, it's, that's another deal. Yeah, no, you know, listen, let's, let's, uh, I got one more question hey, here. Man, hey, dude, are there any, are there any bathroom breaks or anything in this? Thing? No, we're going to wrap it right, we're going to hit set one right here. I just want to have one final question oh. for you, okay? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> um, I just, you know, we're, we're in this time, uh, where, that we're living through, like, there's just not, in my mind, one reason I started my show is I just, I, I don't see that there's a lot of leadership. Um, uh, not a lot of moral leadership and whatever that word means. Again, we've been talking about words today, but I right. kind of wanted you to talk about um, the, the two, it's a two part question. Uh, who was the best leader that you worked with and what are the most important qualities of leadership on the bandstand? Oh, I'll tell you who's really, really a great, well, it's impossible to say. Well, this is the most. No, just, 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 just whatever comes to you. Just, just, just who's the, who's a good leader? The most leader? recent example of a guy in a studio that is absolutely great 
who knows how to get it done in the most beautiful way is Herb Peterson. I've known and been friends with Herb for a long time. And um, I would have to say, uh, he, he's been working with somebody and I got, you know, he invited me to come down and just kind of hang. And just the environment that he created in this guy's studio, it's, it's, it's at his home, but it's in a separate building. And it's great. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a real studio. And just thinking about Herb and how he knows how to um, interact with people, keep it funny, keep it loose, keep it relaxed. Those are the qualities of leadership. I think people respond to love. People respond to truth. People respond to kindness. And, and there's, there's a lot of room. I mean, if you ever heard uh, Herb and, and, and me, uh, we joke all the time. And there's always that kind of, there's edges and cynicism. We're cynical people. We're funny and all that kind of thing. But um, leadership, yeah. But there's, there's all kinds of people like that. And then there's people that get it done, but it's not exactly... I like a comfortable, a comfortable situation. I really like it. I'm too old. I've been through it. And I don't, I don't need to do anything. I don't, and by that, I mean not financially. I just, I'm, not, I'm not bucking for a career. Uh, I went through all kinds of, of on and off about doing this interview. I mean... I guess you probably have sort of figured that out. I felt that. Yeah, no, I did. I mean, I, I, I yeah, but I mean, like you, oh. in, in general, it's like. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm reclusive. Uh, I'm, I'm a reclusive guy. You know, I know how to get along with people. I like people, but I like them on my terms. I, you know, m when you said, hey, man, I'm going to come to your house. All of a sudden, everything just went, whoa. Yeah, but, yeah no, I, I'm, I, I, I know. Yeah. Don't worry. It, 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 you can say no. It's okay. I'm just saying. It's oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chances are very good that I will, but that's neither. okay. <laughs> anyway, man, you know you're a, you're a great interviewer because I I'm talking to you like I've known you. You're yeah. talking to me, and that's the other thing. When you contact me on Facebook, at first I was going, God, who is this guy? He talks like he's known me all his life. He's kind of kind of strange. I'm talking to my girlfriend about it, and she's going, Well, you know, you know, how can you tell? It's a written thing and whatever. I'm going, Nah, I, I don't think. I don't need to do this. This is not something I need to do. Uh, I've been with on and off with these people for years and years and years. The most recent is the stuff I've done with Colin Hay. And, um, yeah, you know, nobody's actually – and I like it that way. I really do because if I really truly do like being behind the scenes, which I do, that's how you do it. <laughs> you don't do this kind of thing. Not that this is going to be problematic, because by this stage of the game, I kind of know what I'm doing, and I'm not a people pleaser at this point, and, and, and you know, I'm not trying to win the, uh, you know, popularity contest. No, and, and, and I mean, to be honest, I, I mean, out of everything, I think that was like the, mo the, the most sophisticated answer that, that you gave, because, I mean, you know, I, I have been on a mission i mean i've done everybody from bill cosby for two hours before the world caved in on him to herb peterson to ahmad mm -hmm. jamal to michael georgiatis and every i mean when i'm when i'm doing my monologue intro for ahmad jamal and i'm saying that he played burlesque houses and he goes jake how do you know i did that who told you that i said nobody did i said i just know from enough all the time that these three thousand plus interviews i know you guys i know what you did i know i don't know you personally but i just taken it to a level where it's what you talked about with leadership is i'm trying to infuse that with my not just my listening audience but also connecting people on new media because as we know new media can be used for a lot of nefarious things and i'm trying to use it for inspiration and i'm trying to use it to embolden people to find their their true nature and i think that i completely respect um your point of view and where you came from but i am so humbled and grateful that you decided to take this opportunity because um i it was it, you know it's really for me it's it, it's incredibly meaningful so thank you for um, well, thank you. All right, and and uh, and I'll, I'm I'm going to be on the road for a minute, but I will get you. Do you have a uh, a Dropbox account or anything like that? 
Yeah, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that off. It. We'll do that off air. I'm just saying, I, I want to get you a copy of this. You can tell me what you want me to edit, and then uh, before Beautiful. before yep. I make it go public, and then I'll send you all these interviews too that you can listen to. You're going to put a smile on your face. Okay. But now, this this phone that I'm talking to you on is a landline, which I never use because all I get are telemarketers. But uh, my cell phone is has been problematic in Topanga. I just talked to Verizon last night. And they're sending me something called an extender in the next few days. It might work better, but I don't want. Obviously, I'm not going to give that number. No, out. no. Let me listen. I am just. I just want you to set, sit back, and enjoy, and just contemplate a set two. That's all I want you to do at this point. All right, and because we had a ball today, and just enjoy your time. Yeah, I really appreciate it, man. I, I had fun. I, uh, strangely enough. <laughs> well, no. The, the, I also, I just want to say. I mean, for me, you said this could be real short. And we're we're now we're at uh, ninety four minutes, ninety five minutes of, of set one here. You're kidding me. No. Oh wow. Yeah. I didn't even look at the clock. You know, and again, when you just on the last thing we were just talking about, um, yeah. You know, that was the answer to the truth in music. Oh, what do you do? Tell the truth, make it rhyme. That it's all one thing. It's not broken up into songs. You're talking about what's going on in this country. That's a three day interview. Let's or and I and I wouldn't do it because it's too insane. And, uh, I agree. No, out. but I think that I know. I know you do. I picked up. I picked up the the, the key things. Um, and I so, think it's important. Yeah. And I, that, that's what I'm, for 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 future generations and younger generations. They the they're, the only cats left that are really willing to tell the truth are you guys. That's the truth. I mean, I don't want to talk to pundits oh, or sad. or media that's analysts. Really yeah. Sad. Well, I mean, think about it. Where where I mean. Yeah. So. Anyway, Michael, yeah. what an honor, man. Michael Georgiatis, thank you so much for making the time. And, oh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Jake. And we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll do it again soon. All right. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, have a beautiful day. And, uh, and I'll Yeah, get... you too. All right. Take care. You, you have a beautiful everything, okay? Thank you, boss. All right, man. Much love. You. Thank you, man. Later. Bye. Bye. Michael Georgiatis, it's a crowning achievement here on the Jake Feinberg Show to talk to cats like that, true leaders, people that have lived through it and have been gifted a lot of stuff and also given back a lot. I'm on the road for a minute. I'll be back next week on the Jake Feinberg Show. Until then, peace. Life in its illusion really makes me wonder. Sunrise gives the morning light